Good morning, everyone. Hope you're having a fantastic Monday morning. We have covered quite a few problems in this playlist already regarding blocks and ramps and stuff, but one thing we have yet to see is multiple blocks sliding down the same ramp that happen to be connected. Now, this one is a tricky problem, but the big thing I want to talk about in this one is that we're going to challenge a previous assumption that we used in our uh, older videos, too. So let's go ahead and dive into it and see how it works. Here we have two blocks, block A here with mass 4 kilograms, and block B here with mass 8 kilograms, which are connected by a string. And they are both sliding down in the same direction, a 30 degree incline plane. The coefficient of kinetic friction between the 4 kilogram block, block A, and the plane is 0.250 and the coefficient between the 8 kilogram block, block B here, and the plane is a bit larger, 0 0.350. We have three tasks here. For part A, we need to calculate the acceleration of each block. In part B, we need to calculate the tension in the string. And then for part C, we need to figure out what happens if we switch the positions of the blocks, where block B is now at the bottom and block A is up at the top. There's no special setup required here before we do our normal approach, so let's do the free body diagrams straight away. And one thing I'll do is blow the picture up a bit so we can kind of see things a little bit better. Uh, as always, I would recommend starting things off by labeling a coordinate system, which I've done here up and to the left to save a little bit of room. Here, the x-axis is going to be at a 30 degree angle to represent movement parallel to the ramp direction, or the plane direction, whatever you want to call it. Additionally, since both blocks are moving in the same direction down the ramp, we can save ourselves some work by calling that direction plus x. The vertical direction remains entirely the same. We don't have to change anything there. Um, like we've done several times before, we're going to take our axes and we're going to superimpose them on our objects, which is block A here. Now we're free to add some forces. Let's start with block A's weight, which is going to point straight down. We'll have to decompose this vector since it doesn't lie along the uh, negative y-axis, but let's get the other vectors out of the way first. In the plus y direction, lies our normal force from the ramp which acts on block A. And that is it for the y-axis. Let's move on to the x. Here we can pretty easily see that tension is going to be pointing in the minus x direction because this string here is attached to the right hand side of the block. So let's plug that in there. What about kinetic friction? Okay, We have to account for that one too since we were specifically told about it. Remember that the overall motion of both of these blocks is down the ramp, which means that friction has to act in the direction opposite to that, which is up the ramp alongside the tension, just like this. So that's all the forces now. So before we move on, let's decompose this weight vector into the cosine and sine components. So here's our angle, there's the cosine component and the sine component of the weight of block A. All that's left is to include an acceleration vector off to the side to indicate that the block is moving down the ramp. And that is it. Let's move on to block B here. The story for block B is going to be really similar. Uh, the weight and the normal vectors are going to be in the same spots, but they're going to be twice as large to represent block B having twice the mass of block A. The tension will also play a role here, but since the string on block B is on the left side, naturally the tension is going to point in that left direction too, in the plus x direction. Uh, as for the kinetic friction vector, this one will not change direction, because remember, block B is also sliding down the ramp, so the frictional vector has to still oppose that motion. Uh, all that's going to change is probably the size of this vector. It might be a little bit larger. With every vector included now, uh, we're free to decompose the weight for block B. 
uh, exact same process. We pull in our angle and we grab our cosine and sine components, which are naturally larger because of block B's larger mass, and uh, add the acceleration vector off to the side, and we are ready to move on to the sum of forces. Let's bring block A back into the picture. We'll start off at the top with our vector version of Newton's second law. And in the x direction, we have the following expression. Remember that up and to the right is negative, so we have negative tension, negative uh, kinetic friction on block A, and the only positive term in the x direction is the sine component of the weight, which points down and to the left. And since we called down and to the left the positive direction, we end up with a positive MA on the right-hand side. We don't have to multiply anything by negative 1 or anything like that. Uh, we can simplify this by exchanging the kinetic frictional force with its definition. Mu sub k, for block A specifically, multiplied by the normal force of the ramp acting on block A. But we don't know uh, the value of this expression. We don't know what that is. So let's jump over to the y direction to see if we can get some clarity here. Uh, things are fairly easy in the y direction. Uh, block A does not leave the ramp, so there's no acceleration. And we can just take this negative uh, term here and move it over to the other side. And we get an expression for free for the normal force of the ramp acting on A. Let's go ahead and take what that is equal to and plug it in over here where the normal force for A is listed. And, you know, this is nice and all, but we can't go any further. We weren't given any details about the tension, and we still need to solve for the acceleration. So, therefore, let's underline this equation and come back to it in a bit. The story for block B is going to be almost exactly the same. Same vector expression to start at the top, and we'll begin with the x portion. And the expression is uh, only different in the tension, because for block A, the tension was pointing in the negative direction. Well, for block B, it's now pointing in the positive. But everything else is the same. That's it. So uh, like we did before, let's exchange the frictional force with the definition. Uh, mu sub k, specifically for block B, multiplied by the normal force of the ramp acting on block B. And remember what we did. We switched over to the other direction, the y direction, to get a free equation, which happens here as well. We can just take this term, the cosine portion of block B's weight, move it over to the other side, and hey, now we know what that is. And we are free to plug this piece in over on the other side. And once we do that, Again, there's really nothing else we can do. We don't have a tension. We don't yet have the acceleration. So that is it for the sum of forces. Okay, we'll underline this expression. And now let's grab both of our underlined expressions, bring them together, and utilize a trick to eliminate the tension and solve for the acceleration of both blocks. Uh, here's our expressions. And to eliminate tension, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take both sides of the left-hand parts of these equations and add them together. And we're going to take both of the right-hand sides of these equations and add them together. And to make this a little easier to see, I'm going to chunk them up in parentheses. So as you can see here, uh, this part of the left-hand side of the equation came from up here. And this part came from right here. Similarly with the MAs. I think that's pretty easy to see on the right-hand side there. Uh, now, with that, we don't actually need the parentheses anymore. Uh, they're no longer necessary. That was just kind of something I did to make it easier to see where they came from. So let's go ahead and just drop them. We don't need them anymore. Uh, there's two simplification steps we can do in this particular line here. And uh, the first one that's pretty obvious uh, is that we can add this negative tension and this positive tension together on this side, which will get rid of them completely. And since we want the acceleration of both blocks, we can factor out the acceleration here on the right-hand side. So let's see what that looks like. So we don't have tension anymore on this side, and 
We have factored out the acceleration here. So things are coming along quite nicely, but we can also do a little factorization on the left-hand side too. Notice that these two terms here, they have a weight of block A included in them, and these two terms here have a weight of block B included in them as well. So let's go ahead and factor those out. And here's what we get. Notice that we had a negative sign turn into a positive sign. Uh, that's just being absorbed in over here so that both of these have the same form. So don't get too confused. Everything is still the same. All we've done is just factor out these weights. Now we are free uh, at this point to divide both sides by the sum of the masses over here on the right hand side which I'll do on a fresh slide since we're kind of running out of room here and now we have our acceleration expression and this acceleration is going to apply to both blocks since they're connected by the string putting this into a calculator though it can be kind of annoying so let's approach it piecemeal first what I did here was I exchanged the weight expressions for the definitions, mg. Okay, so same thing, no change. We just have mg in place for weights. Next, what I'm going to do is I'll be taking those values, okay, so 4 times 9.8 and 8 times 9.8 and plugging them in here, okay, so those result in 39.2 and 78.4 respectively. Notice the units, okay, it's kilogram meter per second squared. And now what we want to do is we want to take those values and multiply them by the sum of the trig identities that we have in these parentheses in the numerator. And once we do that, finally, we add the numerators and divide them by the sum of masses in the denominator resulting in the following acceleration for both blocks. This is our answer to part A. But let's ask ourselves the following question. How do we know that both blocks have the same acceleration? You know, I've mentioned this reminder a couple times in several other videos, but there's a very important caveat which I want to make you aware of. This reminder is only true if the tension acting on both blocks is the same, okay? There has to be the same non-zero tension between those connected objects. And here's a visual aid if that's not entirely clear. Here's our situation. We have both blocks sliding down. The string is taut, so therefore the accelerations and the tensions are the same for both blocks. If we have some other situation occurring, like this, where the string is slack, well, things are no longer the same. The accelerations can't be the same because now the tension is zero. And one thing I'd like to point out is you should never just believe what I'm telling you unless I can prove it to you in the numbers. So that's exactly what I'm going to do next. We're going to calculate the tension in the string acting on both blocks and verify the claim that I've made. Here are the, uh, or here's the expression that was underlined for block A. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to algebraically switch the tension and MA so that T ends up on the right hand side because that's what we want to solve for in this part. So it looks like this. Everything we know here, so we can just plug and chug and see what pops out. And here's what we get. 2.26 newtons of tension acting on block A. Now, what about block B? It better be the same, or I'm in some serious trouble. So let's go ahead and check. We make the same kind of algebraic adjustments to block B's expression, where we get tension by itself. Okay, So I'm going to move everything over on the right-hand side for block B here. Uh, we know the same uh, values for block, or uh, for, yeah, we know the same values for block B, excuse me, so now we can just plug everything in. Here's what that looks like. And we get the same tension as expected. This is our answer for part B. Now finally, for part C, we are switching up the blocks. What now? Well, as you saw in that previous slide, 
their accelerations can no longer be the same. Well, you might ask, how is that important? Well, let's take a look here. Since block A has less kinetic friction to deal with compared to block B, block A, you know, we would expect this to accelerate down the ramp faster. And if the ramp is long enough, they're going to get closer and closer until they just collide together as one object. Now, another important question. How do we actually know the accelerations would be different? Okay, I need to prove this to you in the numbers. It's not enough for me to just say it qualitatively. So let's go ahead and calculate those new accelerations. Essentially, we're going to go back to our underlined expressions that I had before. But now, since we switched the blocks, the rope is slack and the tension is zero and it doesn't exist anymore. So it's almost like our expressions look like this now. Let's uh, do them one by one and check out block A's new acceleration first. To get that acceleration, of course, I'm going to have to, have to uh, divide both sides by the mass of block A here and then plug in the known values, just like this. So as you can see, <laughs> it's clearly not the same as the previous acceleration. It's larger. But we still have to check block B. I'm not in the clear yet. It's the same idea here in the exact same process. This was our underlined expression. I just removed the tension because it's now zero. And I'm going to divide both sides by block B's mass, like this. At this point, plug and chug. Here's what comes out. Definitely smaller. The proof is indeed in the numbers. But now I've been talking for a while. Let's go ahead and wrap this all up in the solution card so it's kind of easy to see this all on one slide. Here are the answers that we obtained for each part of the problem. In part A, we saw that the blocks were connected by a taut string, so they shared the same acceleration, this value, 2.21 meters per second squared. In part B, we calculated the tension acting on both blocks to verify that claim. And we found out, hey, it's the same for both blocks as well. It's 2.26 newtons acting on both. Finally, in part C, the configuration of the blocks, well, the new configuration of the blocks, along with their different coefficients of kinetic friction, meant that the string was no longer taut. It's slack now. And this means that the blocks had new individual accelerations. Okay, For block A, it's this larger one, 2.78 meters per second squared. And for block B, it's this smaller one, 1.93 meters per second squared. And uh, with this, we came to the reasonable conclusion that they are going to eventually collide if they have enough ramp to do so. And so that is it for this problem. I hope that it helped. Take care, everybody.